Prophecy is a subject, I'm afraid, that we have uh, gotten ourselves, like many other areas, into uh, a rut in our way of thinking about it. It's, a, it's an area where I think you have to be very careful about dogmatizing. If you've received one of our little booklets on the doctrines and beliefs of the Church of God International, you will notice, maybe you didn't notice, but you should notice, there is not one item in that, as far as I can recall, that has anything to do with prophecy. In other words, there is no prophecy or understanding of prophecy that forms a part of the basic doctrine of the Church. Now, I believe that that's fairly important and that that, that be the case, because I think probably some of you have got in the back of your Bible somewhere or in one of your files a little prophecy chart that was published. It was in the center of the old uh, Who is the Beast booklet. And it laid out Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Revelation 13, Revelation 17, all in nice, neat arrangements for you. And so all of us as students in Ambassador College dutifully copied notes in the margin of our Bible. We got all those things carefully identified. We got all the explanations down, and it became a part of the accepted teaching of the ministry of the Church. And in fact, I think right now, if I were attending a worldwide or preaching to a worldwide Church of God congregation somewhere, I would find myself in serious trouble to preach the sermon that I'm going to preach to you this afternoon, because I'm going to call in question some ideas that have been held as sacred cows virtually in the understanding of prophecy by an awful lot of people for an awful long period of time. I may not be right. How's that for a, a starter in some of the things that I'm going to advance to you this afternoon? And why should I worry about that? Because didn't Paul say in 1 Corinthians 13, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, he doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, make any distinction on whether those are human prophecies or God's prophecies. He just says, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now, I think he's talking about prophecies like those were of Jonah, where Jonah went walking through the city of Nineveh and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That wasn't a what-if statement. That wasn't a, a you better repent or else it's going to happen statement. It was a concrete, black and white, bald faced prophecy that Jonah gave that didn't come to pass. Very embarrassing to Jonah. Humiliating to him. He was mortified by the whole thing. Got in a very rotten attitude about it, but that prophecy failed. What this seems to say to me is that I can get up here and be absolutely right about prophecy and be wrong next week because of something God decided or a change he decided to make. Now, what does that mean? Does that then mean that, that there's no point in studying prophecy at all? Oh, no. Oh, no. Because it's prophecy is that one source of the Bible that we can go to in order not to be totally in the dark as events begin to take place around us. With prophecy and biblical prophecy, you need to know what the Bible says so that you will understand events as they begin taking place and be able to tell where they're going. Not to limit God, not to put God in a box, not to say to yourself, well, God cannot walk up to a certain point as prophecy begins to fulfill and then decide to back off. He can. But at least if you're aware, you cannot be caught, uh, you know, totally unaware as, as a thief would come upon one and not know where you're going or not know what it is that God is doing here upon the earth. So as, as one of the, the biblical writers, Peter said, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. And to lock in your mind a certain way of thinking about prophecy is rather dangerous. Now, the, the little chart is, very, is a very useful little chart, if you happen to have one, as long as you understand it as a theory of prophecy. A theory of prophecy. You may find also a certain amount of interest uh, from uh, the late great planet Earth, which represents a theory of prophecy. What's the gentleman's name? Uh, Hal Lindsey, right has a certain pattern of ideas that he that would advance regarding prophecy. I differ with him in several important areas, but that's, that's not important, the fact that we might differ in certain areas. That he has advanced a theory of prophecy that deserves a thoughtful attention on the part of those people who are serious about the study of the subject. Uh, and so it is with the old beast chart that you may have in the back of your Bible, or that you may have in a booklet at home stuck away in a, in a box somewhere where you have your old literature. It deserves attention because it is a valuable prophetic theory or outline. But I think I can show now that it is an error in a couple of very serious uh, or very important considerations. And there are some potential 
uh, some very some potentially very serious consequences for that as you get down into the, in the, the uh, understanding of prophecy. Now, the title of this sermon, The Antichrist, is misleading in a way, and I want to explain to you why. There is only one biblical writer who uses the term Antichrist at all. No one else uses it, and yet there are several biblical writers that refer to the Antichrist. I want you to turn back with me, first of all, to 1 John. John is the one who seems, as far as we can tell, to have coined the phrase Antichrist. And he says there is not one Antichrist, but many. In 1 John 2 and verse 18, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. Now, you see what I mean about the title being a bit of a misnomer in a way, because you don't just merely have one Antichrist, you have many Antichrists. And John says that there are many Antichrists in his own day. Now, basically, John believed, and I have no doubt Paul believed, that they were living in the last days of man. They had seen so many prophecies fulfilled, at least in type, that it was difficult for them not to believe that some of these things were about to come upon them. And so they felt that they were living in the last time, and in a manner of speaking they were, were because it would seem that the biblical writers do refer to that age of man subsequent to Christ's ascension to the heaven as being the latter days, in a broad sense. Usually, though, when we say the last days or the latter days, it's fairly specific what we're talking about. We're talking about those years leading up to, let's say, the last generation of man before the return of Christ. He said in verse 19, these people, these antichrists, went out from us. Now, in order not to misunderstand what John is saying, let's be careful to bear in mind that he is talking about a very specific group of people. The chances are the people reading his letter will be able to name virtually every one of them. These people who went out were against Christ in their own mind. Now, it's important because we tend to think that other people who uh, believe in their own mind and they will say that they are serving Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we might, if you call them Antichrist, you are missing the point of what John was saying. Read on in what this gentleman is saying here. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest or obvious that they were not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One. You know all things, and I have not written to you because you don't know the truth. You know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? These people were not merely anti-Christ. They were anti-Christian in the sense of a Muslim who would deny that Jesus was the Messiah. You follow me? Religious people, perhaps, holding a belief or a concept of a God, perhaps, but denying the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. And not only that, he is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Jews? Probably not. Probably not. You are dealing with people here now who are abandoning the Judeo-Christian religion altogether. I think that's important. Because I'm afraid that in time past we've tended to look at this and brand as anti-Christ or anti-Christian people who differed with us doctrinally. And that's a mistake. There was much more to that in this situation than just simply people who differed with you on a point of doctrine, to point the finger and say, aha, anti-Christ. Now, the word anti means against Christ. It doesn't mean simply set over against or in opposition to. The word anti means against. You know what it means to be anti-Semitic, don't you? It means to be against the Jews. Well, to be anti-Christian is a similar type of expression, this time toward Christians, not toward that particular group. Whosoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. All right, now let's pass over just a few pages more to 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now hereby... You know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now, 
Before I go any further, there are a lot of people in time that have asked a lot of questions about this, and they, they, they feel that some of these statements of John are almost like a shibboleth, a, a formula that you can use to infallibly determine whether or not somebody is of God and is not of God. That is not the case. I'll tell you why. John's readers knew who he was talking about. He was talking about a very specific group of people who had specific concepts and specific beliefs, and he was addressing, in that situation, those who say this are of Antichrist and those who say that are not. He was not trying to give us a formula that would be good for all time to identify spirits that are of God and spirits that are not. You know that that's true. The devil can, can confess that Jesus is the Christ. Nobody knows it better. And John was not intending to give us a shibboleth, a little formula that we can get someone to pronounce and thereby know, because people can lie about their beliefs. No, John was dealing with a very specific case in history, and he was helping us to understand what's tall, what he's talking about. We mentioned his Antichrist. He says, Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you should heard that it should come. Even now is it in the world. He was identifying one aspect of the spirit of Antichrist. Second John 7 is the only other place, as far as I can tell here in the New Testament, John, as I said, is the only New Testament writer that uses the term. He says in verse 7 of Second John, Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist, meaning essentially the, the do not confess that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh, in the sense that he is living his life in us. It basically is the explanation those who uh, uh, believe that Jesus would live his life in us in the flesh today, different from the way he lived it when he was here before, are contrary to Christ and Antichrist. And that may possibly be true. On the other hand, John, again, is dealing with a, a specific situation in his own context. And it's possible that there were people in this particular heresy who were denying that, that the Messiah had come in the flesh, that Jesus was the Messiah, or that even if he was, he was only appeared to be flesh and was not really flesh, which I understand was another uh, early doctrinal belief of some early people. Okay, summary. Not one Antichrist, but many Antichrists. John applied it to a specific situation in his own day. Yet there is apparently an ultimate Antichrist. And when you hear people use the expression, the Antichrist, what they essentially mean by that, and it's, it's a useful expression because it's got more power to it somehow than man of sin or some of the other expressions for this person, they are referring to one that is mentioned in prophecy in any number of places, who is to come just before the return of Jesus Christ, whom Jesus Christ is going to personally destroy, who has prophesied to do certain very specific things. And so perhaps the term the Antichrist is useful to us as long as we understand that it's not just a question of uh, that one, but that there is a spirit. There is an anti-Christian spirit that is at work in the world, and certainly epit uh, epitomized in Satan the devil. Now, if you'll turn back to 1 Thessalonians, we come to one of the more interesting and one of the more relevant prophecies having to do with this, this person. Now we're going to become more specific. Now we're not referring to someone that can just simply be a group of people who might apostatize from a local church and go out and be denying that Jesus was the Christ and giving a local minister a lot of troubles in a local area. We're going to abandon that particular meaning of the spirit of Antichrist and the many Antichrists that can exist. And now we're going to start trying to talk about a very specific person. And yet again, we're not exactly talking about a specific person, uh, a specific person, but rather at least two, and possibly more, who have fulfilled the role of this man of sin, as he's going to be called here. Several different ways in which this individual is expressed in prophecy. He is called a little horn back in Daniel. In fact, he's called two different little horns back in Daniel. There is a little horn on the beast, there's a little horn on the he-goat, which are two different individuals in the book of Daniel. We'll come to that in a moment. He is called a, a, uh, a vile person, a king of fierce countenance. Uh, he is called here, of course, the man of sin, or man of, of anomia, which basically means lawlessness or no law. In uh, 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, purporting to be from us, 
as that the day of Christ is at hand. His first epistle, you go back and read it and you realize the terrific amount of persecution that existed in that time, it's not difficult to see how some people could have read his first epistle and jumped to conclusions about the return of Christ being imminent. But Paul says, wait a minute, we all hope that Jesus' return will be in our lifetime. We really hope that we are the last generation of man before Christ returns. However, let no man deceive you, verse 3, by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come the apostasy first. The word apostasy is just a transliteration of the Greek apostasia, and it just simply means a falling away, an abandonment, a, uh, a forsaking, a great forsaking of the truth. Paul seems to be referring to some major apostasy that is to take place, and he is referring to it in the end time. Now, in some degree, an apostasy had begun to take place in the first century church. To some degree. John speaks of people going out from us, and so you could easily see some of them referring to that as the apostasy. But it had been revealed to Paul that something else had to take place. Something pretty big had to take place. An apostasy or a falling away. But a falling away from what? Well, apparently a falling away from the true Christian religion. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, the man of sin, or anomia, is, I think, a very important consideration. I want to uh, pause. I have just a couple of notes on the subject. The word basically means no law. Now, it isn't antinomia, which should be against law exactly, although that meaning comes from it. But in Greek, if you want to uh, negate something, uh, to go into a, uh, a situation where something does not exist, this is as opposed to being against something, you use the little letter A as the prefix for it. And we use that very much in English today. We say that someone is asexual, for example. He's not homosexual, bisexual, or heterosexual. He is asexual, which means he has no sex life at all. All right, uh, that, say, that, that, that prefix is derived from the Greek. And the word nomos means law, and they just simply put a in front of it. It would be anomos, but then it is changed to anomia, which is a different construction of the word, feminine uh, in gender, which has nothing to do with, uh, with, with uh, gender as we know it regarding to sexes, uh, but simply a uh, grammatical consideration. Anomia, which means the condition of one without law. Simple, isn't it? Anomia. The man who is in the condition of being without law law. It says either because he is ignorant of it, or because he is violating it, or because of contempt and violation of the law, it is translated iniquity and wickedness frequently in your Bible. Not so often is it translated sin. This is rather interesting, because uh, it normally, if it were man of sin, it would be man of hamartia. The word most often translated sin in your Bible, hamartia, means missing the mark, should have been translated that way if it were man of sin. I mean, it should have been in the Greek that way. But man of anomia means basically man of no law, man of lawlessness. And that's the theme of this thing. Contempt, violation of the law, iniquity, or wickedness. The Pharisees in Matthew 23, 28 are said to be full of iniquity, which means lawlessness. And yet here was a group of people who supposedly were very dedicated to the law. Yet Jesus said they broke the law of God by their tradition. Uh, Matthew 24, 12, because iniquity is multiplied, love of many is wax, wax is cold, the word iniquity is anomia, which means lawlessness. In other words, because there is a no-law attitude, the love of many waxes cold. Second Thessalonians, we just have looked at, Titus 2, 14, that he might redeem us from all, Jesus is to redeem us from all anomia, or lawlessness. Many references I could go into, I have them in my notes for a booklet that I hope to write on the subject later, but uh, it is, I think, a very interesting way of understanding this. All right. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, that man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Now this is very interesting because it's difficult to take a Christian leader of any sort, of any sect, no matter how big or how small, shall we be specific, because so many people over the years have identified the Roman Catholic Pope as the man of sin. In fact, I think even your King James Bible in the introduction he is referred to that way. The question is, this person is to oppose all that is called God. The Pope doesn't do that. He does not oppose all that is called God. Uh, whenever you see the, uh, the ceremonies all with the coronation of a new Pope, 
or as I did once in St. Peter, the, uh, uh, the, I guess, investiture of several new cardinals, so the, the giving them their red hats, and you hear the, uh, uh, in the translation of the things that are being said there, you're not dealing with people who are opposing all that is called God. In fact, they are very much concerned about that one who is called God all the way through the pages of your Bible, and they believe, very much so, that they are worshiping Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, how incorrect they may be is, is another thing, but it is a little careless. I think Dave Antion quite correctly pointed out that if indeed the Pope were the man of sin, then the whole Protestant world has known about that ever since the Reformation. That's not going to surprise anybody, and I have a feeling this man is going to surprise a lot of people. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Not merely the vicar of Christ, as the Pope advances, but God himself. Now, you have to pause for a moment here and, and try to understand this in the light of history before we go too far down the line. Isaiah said, in one occasion, let them bring forth, let them show us their strong cause. Let them show us the former things, what they be, that we may consider them and understand the latter end thereof. Isaiah 41, 22. What is he saying? He's saying that if you want to understand the latter end of the prophecy, you had better consider very carefully the historical model of that prophecy. Now, you may have heard the terms type and antitype if you've been studying Christian literature for very long, or especially prophetic literature. The whole idea comes, uh, comes from a Greek word, tupos, which simply means a model or a representation of something. Uh, it can be, and the term model is used interestingly enough in, in uh, the English language today, not only to refer, let's say, to a little model of a ship or an airplane that you might carve in your workshop at home, but it's also used to apply to diagrams that many educators and, and research scientists use where they put off little block diagrams and they show the relationship of different things that happen to other things and they put this up and they say, now this is a model of the way this thing works. Human communication, for example, is laid out in a model. It's very simple. They say you have a sender, you have a channel, and you have a receiver. That's the way communication works. They put it on paper, they say that is a model of the human communications process. All right. The Greek word type means model in just exactly that sense. And so whenever you go back and you, you look at these things, you have to understand the historical context in which the prophecy was given in order to understand the latter end thereof. Now let's ask the question, what would Paul have had in mind? Remember, this isn't a, a prophet speaking with, uh, in a trance. This is a man using his own vocabulary, his own mind, communicating with intelligent, rational people in a clear historical context. What is Paul trying to say to these people? Who would they have seen as sitting in the role of a god and who was against all that was called god? A student of history should tumble to that immediately. The emperor. The emperor. Not a religious leader. A civil leader who was a god king would have been instantly identified by a reader living in the Roman Empire in the first century. You see, there was no pope, or anything even resembling a pope at this time. Paul, and in fact, some people see Nero himself as the specific person that Paul had in mind, of uh, the rest restraint that was going on that was not allowing it to be, to be seen in its fullness uh, at the time that this was being written. This was very early, by the way. This was, uh, in fact, this was probably, I'd have to go back and look at my dates again, this may have been pre written pre-Nero, or before Nero. And the whole system, the whole Roman system, was accelerating in its decay and its moral corruption. And then some persecution already beginning to, to show signs of life around the empire. And so they were looking ahead and seeing these things take place. Okay. So he wasn't necessarily thinking in terms of, of something like this taking place as a, a giant worldwide event. And we have to realize that what's taking, what he's talking about here isn't something that takes place in a little Christian sect off in a corner or in a local church congregation. This is something of international implications, which if it isn't clear from this scripture, it certainly will be clear, clear before we're finished. All right, remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time. They did? I don't know if we do or not. Uh, for the mystery of iniquity, that is the mystery of anomia, lawlessness, already is at work. 
Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. There was something holding the thing back. And Paul said, And then shall that wicked be revealed, that wicked one, that man of, of lawlessness, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now Paul very clearly then sees this person as existing right up until the time of Christ and being important enough for Christ to deal with personally at his return. So we're not dealing, as I said, with some obscure little Christian sect somewhere. We're dealing with something pretty significant and something that is to exist in the final days of man's rule on this earth. All right. He goes on then to say, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. There are other references to this same sort of thing taking place, that the power of Satan is given to certain individuals to perform miracles, to deceive people with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. The person who has the love of the truth has an inbuilt, in, you know, built-in protection against deception. You know, a lot of con men have a saying that you cannot cheat an honest man. Now, of course, you can cheat an honest man in the strictest sense of the word, but what they're simply saying is that there has to be a streak of larceny in a mark before you're going to ever be able to really get anything out of it. And then almost inevitably, a good con involves finding somebody who wants to cheat or wants to cut a corner or wants to do something illegal, and you take advantage of that in that person. In fact, of the matter is, it is almost impossible, I think, to deceive somebody who is not encouraging, in some degree, the deception. Usually the deceiver only accomplishes to rationalize what the person already wants to do. And so the love of the truth is the simplest and the best defense against being deceived by this type of thing when it comes to pass. For this cause, he said, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Unrighteousness simply means law-breaking, the turning away from the truth of God as revealed to mankind. All right. Now, this is a fascinating scripture. As I said before, it's one that's been quoted many times. In fact, I've sometimes wondered if you might even see a small model of it take place in the church. But that isn't really the, the point of the prophecy. The historical model of this is found back in the book of Daniel. Now, I want you to turn back with me to the second chapter of the book of Daniel, and we're going to have to be a little bit patient here and work hard to keep our, our attention focused on this and try to sort out exactly what is taking place. When you're dealing with prophecy, uh, you're dealing with a subject that is difficult because of some very specific reasons. Prophecy, unlike just simply written prose, is not intended necessarily to make meaning plain to you. Because much of prophecy comes in the form of dreams or visions, it has a lot of the characteristics of dreams and visions. In dreams, uh, you can actually be talking with someone, and in the process of the playing out of a little scene in your, your dream, the identity of the other person can change. You can start out in this conversation, this give and take, or this uh, interaction with one person, and have it be a totally different person by the time you get to the end of it and not be absolutely sure when you wake up when that change took place in this little dream interaction. Time has absolutely no meaning in dreams. Motion is totally changed, as all of us realize who have tried to run in our dreams and have felt you know, the, the almost slow motion feeling, of the, the struggle that goes on. The, so many laws seem to be totally suspended. If you've ever had one of these dreams where you had a pistol in your hand, which some people have described, where they're trying to shoot somebody, and they keep shooting him, and nothing happens. He doesn't fall. He isn't affected by the, the, uh, the violence that you're perpetrating on him at all. Dreams, uh, all physical laws seem to be suspended. And so consequently, when you start studying prophecy that deals with dreams and all that, you are really dealing with some rather obscure concepts, and sometimes you need a lot of help from other parts of Scripture to understand them at all, and sometimes you won't understand them at all. You're just too far removed, uh, both in history and also in future, from the events themselves to be able to put it together. There is not enough data. But there are some things that can categorically be understood. If you'll turn to Daniel 2 and verse 31. I'm going to bypass all of the introductory material. I think many of you are familiar with it, and if you aren't, you'll want to read it later on to see how the story develops in the book of Daniel and how we get to this particular vision that was given to King Nebuchadnezzar and why it is that Daniel is interpreting it to him in the way that he is. But what's important to us is the content of the vision and the interpretation of the vision. Verse 31, You, O king, saw, and behold a great image. 
This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before you, and the form thereof was awesome. I think a better word than terrible to express it in our language. Awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. You saw till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces together. All of it was broken, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. The wind carried them away that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What does all this mean? Well, it's a message of five kingdoms, four kingdoms of man and the kingdom of God to replace those four kingdoms of man. He says in verse 36, This is the dream. We will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. You, all king, are a king of kings, an emperor, if you will. For the God of heaven has given you kingdom and power and strength and glory. Wherever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, as he given to your hand, has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. After you shall arise another kingdom inferior to you, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all of the earth. Now these are the, 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 the sequence, really, of, of the great so-called world-ruling empires. Of course, they didn't bear rule over all of the, the planet, but they bore rule over the what really amounted to civilization at that time. There were other parts of the world that weren't recognized, really, as being civilization, even though people were there, and even though certain types of civilizations existed in them, like China, for example. But nevertheless, dealing with these times, commentators universally recognize, I think quite correctly, you have, of course, the Babylonian kingdom, followed by the Medo-Persian Medo kingdom, which is here typified as silver, followed by the Alexandrian dynasty, typified as brass in the situation, and then followed by the fourth kingdom, which is the one that always finds the greatest attention in these prophecies because it is the one that exists at the time of Christ's return, universally identified as the Roman Empire by commentators. The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. Since there were two legs, many people see in this the division of the Roman Empire into east and west. And of course, when you come down to the ten toes on the image, commentators see that as the existence of ten nations at the very end time, at the time of Christ's return, the very ten that are smashed by the stone that comes upon them, which is the kingdom of God. He says, verse 42, The toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Whereas you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, like iron is not mixed with clay. What you are dealing is you are dealing with multilingual, multicultural peoples who are not really homogeneous, who do not have the, the closeness and the ties together that will keep them together in a time of adversity. In the Babylonian kingdom, you did not have this, nor did you really when you came all the way down to uh, the Roman-dominated system. This one, though, as it comes to the very end time, has this quality of, uh, uh, of not mixing, of not being blended, of not really having the cohesiveness that's needed for something to, to, ex to exist. Now, it says in verse 44, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and stand forever. Easy to understand as the kingdom of God, where it says in Revelation, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now that's really a, a relatively simple prophecy as laid out. You ask yourself, well now, was this the comprehensive total of all of the kingdoms of man? No. It dealt with no kingdom prior to Nebuchadnezzar because the prophecy begins in the time of Daniel and of Nebuchadnezzar and goes forward from there. You have the great Assyrian uh, kingdom, the great, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the name escapes me for the moment, the one prior to the Assyrians. Uh, but then, you, of course, you also have probably one of the greatest kingdoms of ancient history, the Egyptians, who are not mentioned at all in this context. But they never really had, none of those really had, the kind of world dominance that the Babylonian kingdom had. Now let's just consider some, you know, the summary of this. You have four kingdoms that span the entire time of man, the entire history, from Nebuchadnezzar to the kingdom of God. Secondly, they, represent, they are represented in the form of one image. 
That's a very important concept, because in later prophecies, they are emphasizing a different part of it, and so they will select you four different animals representing the kingdoms, and you tend to think in terms of, well, now, wait a minute, they are completely different in some way. But the original image is all one, and it changes uh, in, in character, but still one image. The whole concept being that this world ruling kingdom, whether it's called Babylon, whether it's called Greece, whether it's called Roman, whether it's called European, is an outgrowth of Babylon, of the Babylonian system. It's all a part of the same world ruling, world dominated, human dominated, actually Satan dominated system of man's government on the earth. So it is one image, even though it is divided into successive kingdoms. Third, the quality declines over the entire time of the system as it exists. It starts off with gold, it goes through to the baser metals, and finally even to a, a, uh, a clay mixed in with the iron in the latter times. It becomes hard, and finally it becomes brittle, and it becomes very vulnerable to destruction at that time. Finally, the ten toes at the end are that which is smashed by this great stone by Christ, which is, of course, the, that, uh, that stone that uh, it, it represents the kingdom of God. He smashes not, he didn't hit the image in its head, he hits it in its feet, which is, of course, the very end time of this image. Now, if you'll pass over now to Daniel, the fourth chapter. In Daniel, the fourth chapter, and you may wonder at first glance how, why this is relevant, but I think we'll see it later on. Verse 4, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace, and I saw a dream that made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. So he made a decree, and he got busy to get the interpreters of the dreams again. Finally, Daniel, verse 8, came before him, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of his God, and whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream. Now, the dream involved uh, a great tree, which was him, Nebuchadnezzar himself, that grew, and all the beasts of the field lodged under the branches of it, you know, sort of showing an imagery that one of the factors and one of the reasons why God had allowed this great kingdom to exist is that it did bring peace, and it gave protection and shelter to an awful lot of the scattered people of the world. And in certain times of its history, the Roman Empire did bring peace. And before it became totally corrupt, it was actually a very dominant influence, for which, it, which enabled uh, pros people and economic prosperity, but also paved the way for the spread of the Christian religion. Not all the things that were done by it were bad, as were not all the things that were done by Nebuchadnezzar bad to start with. But Nebuchadnezzar became exalted in his own eyes, and he was boasting over the things that he had seen and the things that he had accomplished. A watcher comes down from the heaven and says, cut this tree down, band it around its stump so that it doesn't die, that the roots remain alive in the earth, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and so forth. The whole concept of this, and as it was interpreted to him, was Nebuchadnezzar was that tree. He was going to lose his mind. He was going to become like a wild animal. He would, his fingernails would grow long, and his hair would grow, and he would go through a period, as it puts it here, let seven times pass over him. They were going to take away from him the mind of a man and give him the mind of an animal. We refer to it as the seven years of Nebuchadnezzar's insanity. Now, there have been some very interesting things developed out of this. I think that uh, it's important. For one thing, it brings in the concept of the differentiation between the mind of a man and the mind of a beast when it comes to the world leaders and the world governors. Then he talks about then Nebuchadnezzar as the the type or the archetype or the, the historical model, let's say, of those Gentile kingdoms which are going to follow him, goes through a period of seven times, whatever these seven times are, of having the mind, not of a man, but of an animal. Later on he will be represented as one who had had the mind of an animal and had been lifted up and set on his feet and given the mind of a man, a reference to his recovery out of this particular situation. He differs from all those kingdoms to follow in this particular way. All right, what do the seven times mean? There has to be some sort of a flaw in our understanding of the times of the Gentiles. The fact that it was 2,520 years, and in fact you, you count that from the time of the fall of Babylon, which is generally, we have always done, brings you to 1982. And yet it's very evident in the world at large that we are not that close to the end of the times of the Gentiles. Jerusalem really isn't being trodden down of the Gentiles even at this very moment in time. And, of course, the end of the times of the Gentiles seems to coincide with the return of Christ. And there is something that doesn't quite meet. I ask this question. Does times always mean a year 
in the sense of being able to sort it out as 360 days, and 7 times 360 days works out to be 2,520, and you wind up with this period of time, is that always, or is it ever, what that means? Or is he saying, let seven periods, or times, or eras pass over? For Nebuchadnezzar, it probably was seven years, but we don't know that. A time seems to be a year in prophecy, and yet it could just as easily have said years as times. What is it? What was it? I don't know what it was for Nebuchadnezzar, but my question is, later on we will see that the world-ruling kingdom that comes down toward the end time, the Roman Empire, will, will divide up into seven heads. Those seven heads will be seen to be successive, and one wonders if what we are dealing with here is going to be from Nebuchadnezzar on until the time of Christ's return, seven periods of time in which the leaders will have the minds of wild beasts or animals or will be compared to animals. Just a question. I feel, frankly, a little more comfortable with that, although I'm not prepared at this point to identify those seven times or any, any number of them uh, in a historical setting. I think the initial step has to be to ask the question, does it necessarily mean a specific length of time, or does it refer to seven distinct indeterminate periods of time that were to take place with Gentile kings? We'll think about that. We'll see what research turns up in the years or the months to follow. But here we have, as I said, the concept of beasts introduced where Gentile kings are concerned. Now let's turn back to Daniel 7. One of the most fascinating, along with Daniel 11, of all of the prophecies of Scripture. Daniel 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. He wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Now, this first dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel was called upon to interpret it. This dream is given directly to Daniel. And so here are going to be probably some different emphasis, some different information. So Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. I won't take the time to go to all the scriptures relevant to it today, but the whole idea of the sea will be represented later as multitudes of people. It's just the masses of population of the earth. And four great animals came up from the sea, diverse one from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld until the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. The historical model of the lion is Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the beginning of the Babylonian kingdom. Behold another beast, a second, like a bear. It raised itself up on one side. It had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. The historical model of this, the Medo-Persian empire. Now remember the first image we had, the head of gold, Babylon. Immediately following, the breast and arms, silver, the Medo-Persian. This time we have one beast representing Babylon, another beast representing the Medo-Persian empire. A different look now at that concept of Daniel 2. And with certain very key information in this one that was not in that one. Behold, he said, and after this I beheld another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After his death, two of these are destined to become extremely powerful. The other two will become almost meaningless in history. The two who become powerful are the, nor the king of the north and the king of the south. You may very well have heard those terms at some time in your Bible study. Then, you know, one of them says at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him at the king of the north, and off we go into the events leading up to the return of Christ. All right, that king of the south and king of the north in the historical model are the two kingdoms. One of them of Egypt is the king of the south. The other one, the king of the north, are the Seleucids, as it's called, which probably means absolutely nothing to you, but was a large area of country directly to the north of Palestine uh, that was ruled for the first period of its time basically by a group of kings called Antiochus, Antiochus I, Antiochus VII, II, and so forth, till we come to one man named Antiochus Epiphanes, who becomes a very pivotal person in all these prophecies. Okay, so everything is basically in agreement with this image of Daniel 2. You're just working your way down the image in the one case, or you're working your way through successive beasts in the other, or animals, to emphasize a little different part of this. Now remember, this is all a dream. It's a vision that Daniel has, and so it's, it's going to be very uh, fantastic. It's going to be far out. It's going to be difficult to follow in many aspects of it, and yet the 
looking back in history, it's not that hard to identify it with the historical events it's talking about. Okay. After this I behold another. I saw in the night visions, I'm sorry, and behold, verse 7, a fourth animal. Now, he doesn't say this is like anything particular because it really doesn't resemble anything that's ever existed before it. Dreadful, terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, this is interesting because, and I remember the very first time I began to study this scripture, I said to myself, ten horns on the fourth beast, ten toes on the image, probably the same thing. Now, that's logical, isn't it? Not difficult to follow why that would be. The problem came as I later began to study, and it was pointed out to me, or theorized, that these ten kings did not represent the same thing as the ten toes, those, those ten horns didn't. They represented ten successive kingdoms that would exist on this fourth beast. Now, that's fine, but uh, as I began to read uh, the old our, our book, Who is the Beast?, it sort of assumed that. Didn't really prove it. And then it went along a little further and it sort of stepped back and said, now the reason we know this is because there has never been a time when ten kings existed simultaneously in the Roman Empire, therefore they must be successive. What's wrong with that? It's fairly obvious. Just because they have never existed before does not mean they would not exist simultaneously later. And we know that some do. The ten toes, remember, are going to exist simultaneously. Or a person might want to argue, well, I don't know, maybe those ten toes don't mean what we thought they meant. Good for you if you're asking that question, because whenever you start asking me, that doesn't mean what I always thought it meant. You're taking a step in the right direction. Now, it may turn out that it does mean what you always thought it meant. But you need to learn sometimes to say, well, now, wait a minute, let's step back and let's look at this from a different angle and see if it still says the same thing. Now, the reason I think this is pretty, pretty important, <clears throat> I want you to keep your, your place here and turn back with me to the 17th chapter of Revelation. Revelation chapter 17. Now, in this chapter, we have a beast, an animal. He's described in verse 3. He carried me in the way in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored covered beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Okay. Now, here another ten-horned beast. Are these ten horns successive, or are they contemporaneous? Do they exist at the same time with one another? All right, down in verse 9. The seven heads are seven mountains upon which the, were, the woman sits. And don't make the, the rather common mistake that people make of saying, oh, oh, that's the seven hills of Rome. No, no, not at all. Because it explains in verse 10 what those seven mountains are. They are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, and the other is not yet come. Now, can we say safely of the seven kings that these are successive? Yeah, at least partially, because it said five are fallen, one is, one is still to come. Man, that sounds successive to me. Now, we don't really need, then, if we have the seven heads that are successive, the ten horns to be successive, too, do we? Read what it says. It goes on, then, to say, the beast that was and is not, he is the eighth, and of the seven, and goes to perdition. That's a beautiful verse. Maybe we'll get time to come back to it. Maybe we won't. Uh, and the ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. What does that say to you? Seems to say that those ten kings exist all at the same time, doesn't it? You bet it does. Now, if you turn back to Revelation 13, we we'll want to take another look at these scriptures a bit later, but I want us to, to, to consider what we're looking at. Revelation 13, verse 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, do you feel safe in assuming that the beast in Revelation 17 that had seven heads and ten horns, and this one that has seven heads and ten horns, are the same beast? Seems pretty safe. I mean, if we're going to say at all that the Bible interprets the Bible and we find two, a beast in two different places that has seven heads and ten horns, how many beasts can there be like that in the Bible? Well, it pretty well has to be the same. Now the question again, are these seven heads successive? Probably. Are the ten horns contemporaneous? Certainly. 
Well, he goes on explaining about all these things, and you'll find in, in your study of this that this beast seems to be the legitimate descendant, really, of the Roman Empire, that it is, uh, has some of the characteristics, as a matter of fact, of the Babylonian, the, uh, the Greek, the, the Medo-Persian, and the Greek, the Empire of Greece under Alexander. All those three are all combined into it as well. So you, you've got the succession of Nebuchadnezzar's image. It's got seven heads and it's got ten horns, and those ten horns are contemporaneous at the end time. Now, if you have one of these old charts, uh, you'll look down it and you'll find that as it starts laying out these ten horns in succession, you really have a problem when you start trying to identify all these things because you, what, what is done in this booklet is to bring in the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths, three groups of barbarians who came in and conquered Rome and ruled it for a period of time and were then ousted, only to be replaced by another group of barbarians that came in. The question I would have at this point is could you consider barbarian tribes who pillaged and sacked Rome and managed to retain control of it for a period of time until the Romans drove them out as being a legitimate horn of power of the Roman Empire? doesn't really fit. And the truth of the matter is it was Roman legions that sent them out, not the, the little horn, as we're going to be talking about. Let's go back now to Daniel 7 and see if we can put a little perspective on some of this. He says that this beast had ten horns. I considered the horns, and there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, this horn had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld until the thrones were cast down, the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was as white as snow. Now, what you've done is you've followed a similar pattern, haven't you? You've gone through four successive kingdoms, as it were, here represented as animals, the final one being replaced by the Ancient of Days coming back and sitting and giving judgment and then destroying uh, these other kings uh, or kingdoms that existed. He says in verse 11, I beheld them because of the voice of the great words that which the horn spoke. I watched until the beast was slain, his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, verse 13, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him. There was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. One of the very early images or, or visions of the kingdom of God, the return of Christ, the establishment of his kingdom. All right, now let's go on to the explanation of this vision. Verse 15, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those that stood by, he's in vision, and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me to know the interpretation of the things. Aha. Now we can speculate to our heart's content, but now we're going to be told, at least to some degree, what it all means. These great beasts which are four are four kings that shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. Okay, you could almost entitle this one the same thing we entitled Daniel 2 a vision of five kingdoms. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were iron, his nails of brass, he devoured and broke in broken pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. I wanted to know the truth of the ten horns in his head and of the other which came up before whom three fell, even of the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Now keep that mouth in your mind. And that's speaking great things, this blasphemous approach of this particular little horn. He becomes very important because you see what we're dealing with in this little horn is the Antichrist in one of the manifestations of the Antichrist. All right. He said in verse uh, 21, I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. He prevailed against them how long? Until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Now, could this be a first, second, or third century pope? No, it cannot be. The reason? Simply because he did not continue to prevail against the saints until the Ancient of Days came, until judgment was established, until the return of Christ. It was as of this moment of time, by anybody's definition, nobody is really prevailing over the saints of God. All right. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, and which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. The ten horns out of this kingdom, what are they? 
They are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. Well, you know, we used to explain that that after them meant after the, the same manner or kind or after the likeness of these other kings. He was a similar sort of king. But the longer we sat and looked at this particular verse, we began to say to ourselves, yeah, but look at the context of it. It's in time. Now, the traditional explanation of this, this, of this in the church has been that these ten kings were successive and that the papacy came along very early in all of this and uprooted the first three, which were the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. Then the next seven of the horns corresponded to the seven heads of the beast. If you have one of those, and you'll, you'll be able to check back and, and see that, that layout of how all that works out. But as we began, as I said, the more we looked at it, the more we had to realize, wait a minute, let's just suppose for a moment that it means exactly what it says after them, in order of time, that the ten kings exist, then rising up in the middle of them is another little horn with a great deal of power, with a mouth speaking great things. It says, he shall speak great words, and others shall arise after them and be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings. Taking a look at our traditional concept of these ten kings that are to exist in Europe at the very end time, represented by the ten toes, and by the way, even in the old booklet and on the chart, you'll find the ten horn of Revelation 17 actually represented as contemporaneous at the end time. So you have ten horns and ten toes, ten kingdoms that exist at the end time that are to be destroyed. You do find those there. Question, does this now give us maybe some inkling as to what might happen to Britain, the Netherlands, the Benelux countries, to uh, some of the other parts, let's say, of the common market, as to how they might initially be involved in it as it forms, and then find themselves immediately defeated, uprooted, uh, uh, or destroyed, and very early on in the events that take place in this United States of Europe, which we do still believe and anticipate taking place as we come up to the return of Christ. It begins to answer, once you uh, break yourself loose from, let's say, trying to look at everything the same way all the time, and begin to ask certain questions, this uprooting of three horns by this little horn becomes a very interesting question in the development of the United States of Europe. And, of course, we're not told at all in prophecy. You, you think you would be. Is it possible that in the uprooting of three, they could be replaced by three others that would be more Eastern in orientation? Because the old Roman Empire, you know, included, in fact, uh, the commentaries refer to the later revivals of the Roman Empire as Germano-Slavonic, basically the Slavic tribes of people in southeastern Europe. And uh, it is rather an interesting question. The Soviet Empire's hold on that part of the world is weakening, definitely. What steps they're going to take in the months and uh, to follow to uh, consolidate that hold are going to be interesting to see. Uh, we are, could be in the position right now, or very close to a place, where there could be some major upheavals in world politics that could set a, a totally different stage in Europe from anything we have seen in recent years and which could make it much more apparent what might be taking place at the end time. Back to Daniel 7. He says in verse 25, This little horn, having subdued three kings, will speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they, that is the saints of the Most High, shall be given into his hand until a time and a time and the dividing of a time. But remember, in the vision, we saw this little horn persecuting the saints right up until the return of Christ. Not with a great hiatus or a long period of time in which he does not. The implication are, is that this person exists on the scene for three and a half short years, which will probably seem like an eternity to those people who are suffering persecution at his hands. I'm beginning to think possibly that we may begin, may see at the very end time, a ten nation, united Europe, with a one single person not necessarily the Pope, who rises up as a major power among that group of people, causes three of those kingdoms or those groups of people to be subdued, brought under the control of the remainder. They're still there. They still exist. But they are, as he puts it here, subdued. 
that a severe persecution against Christians begins for a period of three and one-half years at that period of time which will culminate in the return of Christ. Possible? Let's consider it a theory of prophecy, not as something new to be cast in concrete and not examined again, or to be learned, let's say, diligently and memorized so that you can parrot it to somebody if they ever ask. But the judgment so sit, they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. The kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Okay, now let's consider in summary what we have. We have, in Daniel 7, the most commentators compare these four beasts to the four kingdoms of Daniel 2, Babylon, Medo-Persian, Alexandrian, and Roman. Okay? Next, there's clearly an end-time prophecy. Third, the ten horns may well be contemporaneous at the end time, not necessarily in succession, because we have the succession of these kingdoms, uh, or that is, succession of kings within that fourth kingdom, shown in the seven heads in Revelation. The little horn on the beast obviously can be identified with Paul's man of sin, the Antichrist. Because he has a mouth speaking blasphemies, he is a, a persecutor of the saints as, as Paul's man of sin is going to be. He is, in every sense of the word, an Antichrist. But be careful, there may be more than one Antichrist, lest we say the Antichrist. Also, that he is involved for three and a half times and that he is a major persecutor of Christians. Now let's look at Daniel 8. Now remember we're talking about a little horn. Picture in your mind again the number four. Four animals. Where was the little horn? It was on the fourth animal, the last of those in the sequence, in the last of the kingdom of God. He comes right up to the very end time. Now, we're going to encounter in Daniel 8 a little horn again, but it is not the same. In chapter 8, verse 1, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, even unto me Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in a vision, it came to pass when I saw, I was at Shushan in the palace in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision, and I was by the river of Ulai. I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns. The two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the other came up last. Obscure. All commentators seem to identify this again with the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, on this one, we're omitting Babylon, because we're in the reign of Belshazzar. We're getting late in the day for the kingdom of Babylon. The hand is very nearly writing on the wall, literally, in the sense of this is the prophecy comes right out of this section. And we have... So we, we, we more or less leave the Babylonian and we start this prophecy with the Medo-Persian. I saw this ram pushing west and north and south that nobody could stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. He did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. The goat had a notable horn between his eyes. The animal represents not the king, but the kingdom. It represents Greece. The notable horn between his eyes is Alexander. And by the way, the reason that horn keeps coming up this way is that horn in Hebrew literature is a symbol of power. You'll find it used that way. David refers to my horn this and my horn that in the Psalms. It basically means my power. And it is symbolic in that way. And that's why the horns on these beasts are used in this way. Okay, the not notable horn between his eyes is Alexander. He came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. I saw him come close to the ram. He was moved with choler against, the, the against him and smote the ram, broke his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. He cast him down to the ground, stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. This is all Alexander and his conquering of the Medo-Persian Empire. Therefore, the he-goat, that is Alexander's empire, his system, waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Alexander died. And for it came up four notable ones, four other horns, toward the four winds of heaven, east and west, north and south. And the north and south were the king of the north and the king of the south. All right, out of, the, out of one of them, and that would be the king of the north, came a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Now, this little horn can't be the same as the little horn in the first one. Why not? Because this is on the third animal, that is, the Alexandrian Empire, has nothing to do with Rome, which is the fourth beast. So we have a different little horn. Now, why then are they both called little horns? Because while in one sense they are not the same, in another sense they are the same. 
The little horn that exists, this is the one that we're going into right here and now on in Alexander's time, which will turn out to be one man named Antiochus Epiphanes. This man is the archetype. He is the historical model of the ultimate Antichrist. The ultimate Antichrist is represented by the little horn of Daniel 7. This little horn of Daniel 8 is the historical model of that one that is later to come. One man named Antiochus Epiphanes, of which we will find much information in the 11th chapter of Daniel. So he goes on to talk about what this one is to do. It waxed great even to the host of heaven. It cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Incredible image that we're being given here of, of power that involves even demonic power. We will find that this one did have demonic power. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host. These are references really to historical things that took place involved with uh, Antiochus actually uh, ousting a priest, putting in his own man as the priest in Jerusalem, uh, arranging for one man to buy the priesthood with money that took place. He really corrupted in an incredible sense, the whole priesthood and the whole worship of God during his time. He magnified himself. The place of his sanctuary was cast down. A host was given to him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. It cast down the truth to the ground. It practiced and prospered. And I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said to that certain saint which spoke, there's a tongue twister for you, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? He said unto a thousand and two thousand three hundred days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Uh, some people have found different things on this as far as the, uh, the history of the time of Antiochus Epiphanes and all the things that he did. Others have explained it in different ways. I won't go into that uh, a great deal. But it, the interpretation of this vision begins in verse 15, or actually, I'd say, all the way down to verse 17. He came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. And he said to me, Understand, son of man, at the time of the end shall be the vision. Oh, now here we go. I thought we had just found ourselves in historical context. We thought we'd found ourselves a historical man, the archetype, the man in Alexander's own reign. And yet he says, at the time of the end shall be the vision. Why is this? The answer is, again, we're dealing with prophecy, which has a dreamlike quality, which knows no boundaries as far as time, distance, space, or anything else. And whenever you see and fully understand Antiochus Epiphanes in historical type, the historical model, you will have a much better grasp of what is to take place at the time of the end, because even though it is drawn in the historical context of, of Alexander and the kings that followed him and Antiochus Epiphanes, they are nothing more than shadows on the wall of the ultimate reality that's to take place at the end time. The object of the vision is the end time. But the shadow cast on the wall by that object is one man named Antiochus Epiphanes. You need to understand him and what he did in order to grasp some of the things that the prophets were trying to say. Now, as he was speaking, verse 18, I was in a deep sleep with my face toward the ground. He touched me and he set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make you know what shall be in the last or end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. The ram which you saw having two horns of the kings of Media and Persia. Right? No problem with that. The rough goat is the king of Grecia. The great horn between his eyes is the first king, Alexander. Now, that being broken, four stood up for it. Four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Here's another name for the man of sin. He is here called a king of fierce countenance. He shall, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully, shall prosper and practice, shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace he shall destroy many. This man uses peace like a weapon. How would you do that? Oh, just by deceit, by peace treaties that mean nothing to you but mean everything to the person you're making the treaty with, treaties that you can ignore while the other person cannot. The vision of the evening and the morning, which was told is true, shut up the vision. And uh, he goes on to talk about the things that will take place. Now, this is all, I think, very interesting. You have to summarize it by saying that the ram is Medo-Persia in the historical model. The he-goat is Greece. The notable horn is Alexander the Great. 
The four notable horns are Alexander's successive. The little horn in this historical model, this king of fierce countenance, is Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, this man's name, Antiochus Epiphanes, simply means uh, the uh, manifested one. The whole idea of the epiphany or the, the appearing of one is he actually considered himself to be the manifestation of Zeus. He was, in a very real sense, or considered himself to be, a man or God king. He claimed to be the human epiphany or manifestation of Zeus. He actually determined to impress the Greek way of life upon all of his subjects, whoever they were. And this is what brought him into sharp conflict with the Jews of the time. Now, realize, we are not dealing with a person who was a Jew and who was himself perverse. We're not dealing with any type archetype or model which really would be comparable to the Pope. We are dealing with a person who is in the position of a civil ruler who considers himself to be the human manifestation of a god in the historical model. All right. He demanded absolute submission to his will as a sign of allegiance to Zeus. Jason, the high priest during his time, bought the priesthood outright and actually was subservient to Antiochus. Uh, in the year 169, just after uh, and, uh, this, this period of time, right in this period of time, Antiochus tore down the walls of Jerusalem. He prohibited all of the customs of Judaism. He allowed nothing of the worship of Judaism to be done. Sacrifices, the daily sacrifice, was taken away and not allowed to be performed during his period of time. Now remember, this was all done by a Gentile civil ruler, or a god-king, as it were, uh, of a totally different religion that had nothing to do with the worship of God, of a Greek religion, as a matter of fact. He forbid circumcision. And in this period of time was when some people, you know, and it became quite a serious matter. You think, well, how big a deal is that? Well, whenever all of the games and all of the, uh, the things that were done in public were all done in the nude, it was not the sort of thing you could hide very successfully. Circumcision was forbidden. The feast days and the Sabbaths were outlawed. He put up an altar to Zeus in the temple of God and offered a pig on that altar, which is universally referred to as the abomination of desolation, referred to in Jewish literature, also seen, I think, by Christian commentators in that light. Uh, let's see. Later on in this, uh, in this chapter, uh, we'll find evidence of the Maccabean revolt, where they revolted against his leadership and against the things that he was doing along the way. Okay. This little horn, as I said, in a historical model, Antiochus Epiphanes, his, the things that he was to do were developed very thoroughly in the 11th chapter of Daniel. The little horn on the he-goat, continuing the summary, is not the same as the little horn on the fourth beast, except as type and anti-type. The little horn is a persecutor. He stands up against Christ. He is against Christ or Antichrist. He is extremely powerful. He is a, an economic force in the world and a military force in the world. These things are brought out in these prophecies. Now, if you'll page over to the 11th chapter of Daniel. Neither time nor energy will permit a thorough development of Daniel, the 11th chapter. It is an incredible document. In certain segments of it, it is so accurate, and this is, this is one of the interesting aspects. You may have heard someone in time past, some commentator or read a commentary that dated the book of Daniel about 175 B.C., and may have wondered in your own mind how that would be, about 160, actually. I think some of you have people placed the book of Daniel. When Daniel very expressly places himself in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, the commentators, in reading Daniel, the 11th chapter, find that during this period of time, about 175 to 160 at B.C., the book is too accurate to have been written in Nebuchadnezzar's day. Now, it kind of begs the question, doesn't it, when you get down to it, I mean... The very point of the matter is that, that this is a prophecy given by Almighty God and spoken in vision to a man who then wrote it down. Now, they go on to say that after this period of time, the prophecies then become rather inaccurate. And this is, I, I, thought, I read that and I thought, now that's fascinating. They see by this, as they read it, a simple evidence that this is the period of time in which the man was alive and wrote because he had the historical facts and he wrote them exactly as they were. And then after that, he didn't know what was going to be ahead of him, and so he began to become quite inaccurate. What's the problem with that? The problem with the fact is that he wasn't all that inaccurate. He was. There are certain things about the life and the end of Antiochus Epiphanes that did not take place exactly as they are represented in Daniel, the 11th chapter. What they overlook is the fact 
that this is a dual prophecy dealing not only with Antiochus Epiphanes, but with the ultimate Antichrist at the end time. Therefore, the prophecy does vary. And they forget entirely the incredible accuracy of the rest of the prophecy that goes on beyond the time of Antiochus, beyond the time of the Maccabean revolt, and beyond the time of even Christ. As Daniel has foretold the future. And so, when you understand, it is really a, 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 a very important prophecy. Now, this one, in the historical model, deals with a very narrow period of time. We are no longer dealing, really, with Nebuchadnezzar. The Medo-Persian Empire, basically, is of no longer any import to us. We narrow ourselves down to the time of Alexander, the king of Grecia. He mentions the other kingdoms, but only just in passing, because now we're getting down and focusing on one very small period of time as a historical model for something that's to take place at the time of the end. Some people have referred to this as the longest prophecy in the Bible, as though it, it dealt with a time going all the way from Antiochus Epiphanes and before, really, uh, and then working all the way through the return of Christ. In a sense, that's true, but in another sense, it isn't. In this, because in the, in the second of these senses, what I mean is this. It deals with the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, and it deals with the end time. It really has relatively little to say about any of the things that go on in between. And the, one, and the first occurrence of this prophecy is the historical model that we need to understand in order to grasp what's going to go on at the very time of the end. Well, in this segment, we have Alexander introduced. We have his death. We have the division of his kingdom into four again. And it narrows down now to deal with two individuals in this kingdom. Really, not just two individuals, but the, the two kingdoms with their kings and successors. One of them the king of the south, the other the king of the north. And this goes on all the way through the first half, really, of Dan Daniel's prophecy, as he deals with the Antiochian kings in the north, Antiochus I, the second, the third, and so forth, and with the Ptolemies in the south and the continual conflicts that went on, the wars and the fightings and the intermarriage, the, the political machinations that took place between them. All these things are a matter of record. They're all laid out in commentaries or histories of the time for you to read. But late on in chapter 11, down about verse... Uh, 20. Then shall stand up in his estate, and that is of the king of the north, a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Now there may or there may not be an end time representation of that raiser of taxes. He is not important in this prophecy. And in fact, virtually everything in the verses leading up to this prophecy are historical, they have been, they have happened, they are finished, they are over, and probably many of them will have absolutely no end time fulfillment. Duality in prophecy tends to work that way. It's almost like an overlacing. If you could overlap about two or three of your fingers on a given prophecy, you will find maybe two fingers in the past and two fingers totally in the future. And only a small segment in the middle actually have fulfillment in both times. Some of the events of this prophecy are purely historical, happened one time in history and will never happen again. Some of the events in the prophecy never happened in history, will only happen in the future, and have never happened in the past. There are several of them that happened in the past and will happen in the future. And this is part of the key to understanding the nature of duality in prophecy, along with the, the awareness of the dreamlike quality of it. This Antiochus, this vile person, as he's called here, is very important. The raiser of taxes is mentioned, as far as I know, nowhere in the book of Re Revelation. There is no indication that he even needs to be in, a factor in the picture at all at the end time. But this vile person is very much a factor at the end time. In his estate, verse 21, shall stand up a vile person. Here's another name for the Antichrist. To whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. He shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. In other words, he conquers people by peace, by subterfuge, by deceit. With the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and shall he be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. He shall come up and be strong with a small people. He won't have a great deal to work with to start with. There is actually a, a very modest model of this in Adolf Hitler, a vile person who started with only a very few people, came in and began and made, they really obtained the kingdom by flatteries, by a, uh, an approach of uh, promising the world and, you know, to, to, to promising to solve all their problems, and finally got himself actually elected. And only after he was in did he fully take control. He did bring about a great deal of prosperity in Germany. He solved their economic problems. He was a messiah. 
in many senses to the German people. And yet he was also an antichrist in an almost any sense of the word that a person would want to use. He is himself, and it would be easy to see someone while World War II was going on, wouldn't it? Seeing in Adolf Hitler a fulfillment of the vile person of Daniel and possibly thinking, could this man be the Antichrist leading up until the end time? Turned out he wasn't the ultimate one. But dual prophecies are not merely dual. Sometimes they have multiple uh, fulfillments. All right, passing on now to some of the other things that he, he has to do. He says in verse 25, he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. The king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Now remember, you're looking at this in the historical content. The king of the south in modern fulfillment may not be Egypt. That's an assumption. Because uh, and I'm afraid in many cases we, we have not followed through to understand. For example, Babylon, we are told very clearly, exists in the end time. That Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, exists. Tyre exists at the end time. And yet neither one of those cities amount to a hill of beans today. Tyre, in prophecy of the end time, does not mean that little old village on the coast of the Mediterranean. Babylon, in prophecy, does not mean that heap of ruins over in the wilderness in the Middle East. It means another city in another location of the spirit and who is the illegitimate descendant of the city of Babylon. It doesn't mean the literal city itself. So consequently, when you start thinking of the king of the south being Egypt, it may be, but it does not have to be. It was in the historical model. Once you understand that historical model and begin to watch world events, you may suddenly one day wake up and maybe in the middle of the night sometimes as you lie awake thinking of it, sit bolt up right in your bed and say, it's not Egypt, and suddenly know exactly who it is. That would only happen to you, though, if you are pretty aware of the scriptures and keep aware of world events as they begin to take place. Anyway... He says in verse uh, 27, Both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief. They shall speak uh, lies at one table, which is customary at peace conferences. It shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. He shall return into his land with great riches. His heart shall be against the holy covenant. This was, of course, very much fulfilled in Antiochus Epiphanes, who was very much against the laws of God, fought against them, even stopped circumcision and the sacrifice and the worship of God in every form. He stopped the worship of the Sabbath and of the Holy Days. He shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the ships of Kittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. In other words, he's going to corrupt many people of the Jewish community, which Antiochus did do, and made alliances with them who did forsake the, way, the worship of God. Armed shall stand on his part. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. They'll take away the daily sacrifice. They shall place the abomination that makes desolate. And Jesus warned very carefully about that abomination of desolation in the Olivet Prophecy. Such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Many people see in the historical model the Maccabean Revolt, and those people that stood up for a right at the period of time and were able to defeat some of his forces. Now, when they shall fall, they shall be helped with a little help. Actually, he talks about verse 33. They that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, and by spoil for many days. They weren't just taken off into a place of safety. They actually were there to struggle against this power, and many of them actually gave their lives because of that struggle. At the, at the king... And sorry, and some of them of understanding, verse 35, shall fall to try them, to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, for it is yet for a time appointed. And the king will do according to his will. He shall exalt himself, magnify himself above every god, shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Now, you, you know, it's a little bit difficult to see any religious ruler in the Christ of what is even the so-called Christian religion fulfilling this prophecy in this way. And the historical model was nothing like that at all. The historical model had to do with a civil ruler who considered himself the manifestation not of, of some, uh, something that was called Christian, but of the god Zeus, and who tried everything in his power to stamp out the worship of God. No, it just really doesn't fit, certainly not in the historical model. I think the papacy 
And the Roman Catholic Church do fit in this prophecy. They fit into it very strongly. But I begin to wonder, as the man of sin, as the archetype, or I'm sorry, as the antitype of Antiochus Epiphanes, as the first beast, as that, that power that exists in that way, as the man of sin, I begin to doubt it. I think that we're going to have to see not just one uh, person as a false prophet, but a beast and a false prophet, a civil and a religious ruler. And what we're dealing with in this historical model is the civil ruler and what he does to God's people. The king shall do according to his will. Verse 36. He shall exalt himself, magnify himself above every god, every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper until the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Ernest Martin recently in an article on the Antichrist speculated that the Antichrist would actually be more or less like Satan coming down from heaven, appearing to be Christ in his return, and that he would proceed to do all the things that Christ was prophesied to do upon his return, including the reestablishment of the Sabbath and the holy days, and that the Sabbath, reestablished by Satan, returning as he was cast out of heaven, would be the mark of the beast. One of the most absurd arguments that I have ever heard. Now, the problem with this is this. This person is to come and speak great things against the God of gods, not to come pretending to support the Father in heaven, which Jesus Christ returning to the earth certainly would do. Very half-baked argument. I don't know if any of you saw that particular uh, item or not, but uh, rather useless as far as taking you to any deeper understanding of who this person is and what it is that he's supposed to do. He does then to say uh, in verse 37, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, he shall be apparently celibate, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. Notice, nor regard any god. In his estate he shall honor the god of forces. Now, apparently they're using this in the situation that, of worshiping the military uh, as opposed to worshiping god, because he just said he will not worship any god. I, I rather gather this is a, uh, an idiomatic expression for the military. And he, he shall not honor uh, the God his fathers knew with gold and silver and precious stones and precious things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for the gain. Now comes that famous verse 40. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come at him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and many ships. He shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter into the glorious land many countries shall be overthrown, the thieves shall escape out of his hand. Edom, Moab, the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries, upon the land of Egypt, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. You're dealing with a military ruler, not a religious figure. This is really, I think, the whole, the whole pattern of this person coming in, setting up the tabernacle, as it says in verse uh, 45 of his palace in the, between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, uh, being involved in moving his headquarters, let's say, down to Jerusalem, and somehow or other fulfilling this prophecy. This man is a great, powerful, military and economic force in the world, not merely a, quote, spiritual influence. He really fits far better as a, a civil ruler. But again, what I'm advancing to you today is maybe a, a new theory of prophecy, which needs examination and thought so that we can try maybe to look, look around and, and grasp a bit more what's to take place. Summary. Two of the four divisions of Alexander's empire came into play as the king of the south and the king of the north. Secondly, a the type of the man of sin is here called a vile person, Antiochus Epiphanes. Third, he corrupts many of God's people. Fourth, he pollutes the sanctuary and places the abomination of desolation, whatever that is in the antitype. Five, he is a persecutor of the saints. Six, he is powerful, extremely so, not only economically but militarily. He brings in a period of incredible, perhaps unsurpassed, prosperity. He is, verse uh, number seven, anti-God, anti-covenant, anti-law, which gets us down again to the man of Anomia. He is celibate. He also plants his headquarters at Jerusalem. Daniel 12 is a continuation of the same prophecy. I'm afraid sometimes we tend to refer to the prophecy of Daniel 11 and fail to realize that chapter 12 is a continuation of the same thing. It's very important what is said here in this 12th chapter. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which stands for the children of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. 
This is a unique period of time in all history. It's mentioned several different prophecies through the Bible. It is the time of the day of the Lord, a time of Jacob's trouble, a time of, of tremendous tribulation. At that time your people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So we're all the way down to the time of the resurrection. So here is a prophecy that is a historical model, but it is a historical model that you're to look at and apply to the end time. Some parts of it will find a complete fulfillment in the end time, some parts of it will not. But you need to understand the historical in order to be able to understand sometimes what's happening in the future. If you would turn back just briefly to Revelation 13, I'd like to point out a couple of things for your future study in this area. In Revelation 13, you have not one beast, but two. The first one of these, we are told, is it has seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns upon them, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast was like a leopard, his feet like a bear, and his mouth like a lion. Where have you heard those before? Well, that was the likenesses of these four successive Gentile kingdoms. So this particular vision embodies, again, much like the very first vision we considered, the one of the image in Daniel 2. It brings back into focus again that this system is an ancient system, and that is really the latter-day embodiment of the Babylonian Empire. You see, Rome was nothing more than the illegitimate outgrowth of the Babylonian system as it had gone through the, 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 other, the successive evolutions that it had been through. All right, This beast that rises up is representative of that entire system. Okay, it said, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. His deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. They worshipped the dragon, symbolizing Satan, who gave power to the beast. They worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? It is a war-making power. And there was given to him a mouth. Ah, here's our mouth again. Remember that expression we ran on the little horn and the fourth beast and had a mouth speaking great things? Here it is. This is that little horn as it is expressed in the 13th chapter of Revelation. It is on the beast. It is not a part of the second beast, which is generally seen by commentators as the religious system. All right, this mouth was given a mouth, uh, speaking great things and blasphemies. Power was given to him to continue 42 months. That's three and a half years, a time and times and a half a time. So we are back into that, that same time, period of time, apparently, again. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those that dwell in heaven. It was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Worship who? That little mouth, that mouth speaking great things, that one individual that comes along in the very end time of this kingdom, a great persecuting power, a war-making power a violent, blasphemous power who opposes everything that is called God. Now, it's easy to see why perhaps we might confuse that man of sin with the religious side of this, because the religious side of this whole thing, which follows in the last half of this chapter, is prophesied to do virtually the same thing that the beast has done. And so you could very easily get them confused. Now, for your, just to remind you of it, it says in verse 11, I beheld another beast, this is another animal, another system, if you will, that rose up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and spoke as a dragon. Now, the lamb symbolized in prophecy is Christ, of course. This one appears to be, this time, Christian, but it speaks like the devil himself. It goes on to say, he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. He causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of the men and deceives them that dwell upon earth by means of the miracles. He tells them they should make an image to the beast. Now, this image of the beast is really fascinating. The image is the Greek word icon and basically means a likeness. It doesn't necessarily mean a statue or an engraving. Uh, for example, uh, Christ was in the likeness of the Father. It's like saying the Son, he's the very likeness of his dad. And ba basically the word should probably be translated likeness. So he tells the whole world he should make a likeness to the beast. Now, I don't know how many of you are aware of the traditional teaching of the church relative to the image of the beast. Well, I'll just refresh your memory on it briefly. It has been taught for years in the church that the image of the beast was where the the apostate church adopted the form or the shape or the likeness 
of the Roman civil government of this beast power and use that as the system of operation, the way things worked in the church. And Dr. Hay, uh, in an article he wrote in the Good News magazine back in 1952, did a, made a pretty good case for how the whole thing developed. He quoted a lot of historical sources about the development of the monarchical system in the Church of God. The whole idea being that the, the monarchical system of church government, which is a humanly devised system of ruling over the people in the church, was the image of the beast. I had not really made the connection until very recently, and I read this article again of Herman Hayes and, and was talking to some people and doing some study toward this particular subject, that it suddenly dawned on me, what, what, is, what does it mean when the Church of God, which has existed for many, many years and done, done quite nicely as far as growth and development and, and reaching people with the truth of God, begins to adopt an image of church government like the papacy? If the papacy is the image of the beast, and if the church of God begins to adopt the image of the papacy, what are they doing? What does that mean? How does that impact the brethren in the church? Let's read what this goes on to say about this image of the beast. It said to them in verse 14 that they should make an image to the beast, to the animal which had the wound by a sword and did live. He had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, bond and free, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. What is this mark, this mark of the beast? He used to teach that it was Sunday observance. Well, it's difficult to see, as this goes on to point out, that no man might buy or sell save he had the mark or the name or the number of the name of the beast. It's difficult to see how Sunday observance could stop a person from buying and selling. Oh, on Sunday, yeah, but you know, the, by the time you don't buy and sell on the Sabbath and then you don't buy and sell on Sunday because that's the day they close their stores, it still leaves five days for buying and selling. And it's hard to figure Sunday observance being the mark of the beast. It's not sufficient. It doesn't reach. It doesn't accomplish what we're dealing with, what we're talking about. Also, many people have advanced some strange ideas about credit cards, credit system, computerized cross-checking on, on uh, purchases and so forth. That's the image of the beast. No, it's not the image of the beast. The image of the beast cannot just simply be a credit card. The image of the beast, it says, is in your forehead and your right hand. Now, if you take the time to study in the Bible what that means, it talks about the law of God being in your right hand and in your forehead. What does it mean? Well, the forehead is a symbol of the seat of your thoughts, of your intelligent, rational, decision-making process. The right hand is the symbol of what you do. In other words, it's to have to do with the way you think. You're supposed to believe this and you're supposed to do it. That's easy, isn't it? All right, what you do then is you must receive the mark of the beast in your belief and it must find expression in your actions or you will be blocked out from commerce. It must then be not only economic but religious as well and idolatry or there is no reason why a Christian would be condemned for receiving it and having it and using it. And I've got a whole pocket full of credit cards that have nothing to do with anybody's religion. And if the number on them just happened by happenstance to be 666, it would mean nothing, less than nothing. The mark of the beast has to do with belief and with practice. It probably has to do to belonging to an organization. John lived in a time in the Roman Empire, and as he was expressing this here, probably certain things like the Roman guilds came to mind. Because if you began to get a universal union with which you must be a member in order to buy and sell, and that union is a religious union or guild, now you have got problems. Now you have really got problems. Because you must, if you must adapt and become a part of a state religious system in order to even function in the state, that could have happened in Rome. It never did because certain aspects kept the guilds under control and they were always divided into different guilds. But if they did ever come into one big guild or union, that sort of thing could take place. That's what probably John saw. What it will be for us remains to be seen. Uh, you know, if you don't know what it is right now, that's no big problem. The problem will be when it comes on the scene, you'd better know what it is or be able to recognize it when that time comes. So in Revelation we have two, two beasts, as it were, one the civil system, one which appears to be religious, and that actually uh, is involved almost in the worship of the state, 
I don't know what the image of the beast is. That's rather interesting. There are some uh, fascinating quotations in this article by Herman Hale, New Facts About the Image of the Beast, written back in 52, as I said before, which really rather condemn the approach that uh, his own church is taking today, and rather dramatically so. Finally, I'd like you to turn back to the 17th chapter of Revelation, because as I said, we've kind of wondered, well, if the man of sin is not the Pope, where does the Pope fit into prophecy, if he fits in at all? In Revelation 17, verse 1, there came to me one of the seven angels that had the seven vials and talked with me, saying to me, come here, I'll show you the judgment of the great whore. That's the fallen woman, as it were. Now, the commentaries even bring this out, at least the Protestant commentaries do, I don't know about the Catholic ones, that the, uh, as the woman in Revelation 12 is the church. So the fallen woman, then, is the apostate church. They use that term. They don't refer to it necessarily as the Roman Catholic. They refer to it as the apostate church. And I think that's easy enough to prove in prophecy. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. He led me away in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This is the beast of Revelation 13. The woman is not the beast. She rides upon, is carried along by, is with that beast. It says the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Upon her forehead was written a name, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Verse 6 is important. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, she is not exactly represented as the cause, or let's say the perpetrator of the persecutions of the saints, but that she is drunk with their blood. Because, you see, it was the first beast of Revelation 13, which was the instrumentality for the extraction of the blood of the saints. But apparently this woman is there participating in all of that. The angel said to me, why did you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carried her, which had seven heads and ten horns. The beast you saw was and is not. Now, this prophecy is being given as we come into the day of the Lord, that is, in vision. So there comes a time when this beast doesn't exist. The Roman Empire doesn't exist today, for example. It was, it is not, and it's going to appear out of nowhere. That's basically what this coming out of the abyss means. It's going to appear out of nowhere. It's the people, all those that dwell upon the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life. Verse 9, here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. What are the mountains? They are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, and when he comes he must continue a, a short space. The beast that was and it is not, even he is the eighth. Now notice this is kind of interesting because what we're dealing with here then is something that really isn't quite a part of the original seven uh, successive kingdoms of the Roman Empire. This ultimate one, you have those seven that go along, and then finally, at the end time, you have an eight that comes along. He is of the seven. In other words, he's the same sort of thing. It's a part of the same system, and he goes into perdition. The ten horns you saw are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power one hour with the beast. They have one mind, and shall give their power and strength to the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. The lamb shall overcome them. So where are we? Right at the end time the outgrowth of this great Gentile system as it comes at the very time of the end. The waters, verse 15, that you saw where the fallen woman sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. She has incredible authority over people, I mean, are actually over the lives of people everywhere upon the earth. The ten horns which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the woman, shall make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. This is kind of interesting because the little horn is something that exists right up until the time that Jesus Christ returns and is destroyed by him. The fallen woman, if indeed it is the Roman Catholic Church, is not destroyed by Christ at his return, but is destroyed by those ten nations that form that beast power at the time of the end, before Christ actually appears on the scene. And so he says, God has put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. The woman you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Babylon was the type. Rome, in a sense, the antitype. But as it reaches on down the real fulfillment to a great fallen woman 
the apostate church, however you'd like to understand that. It's, it's such a complicated subject, you almost need to, to go through the whole thing in order to try to get the picture together. I would like, uh, I'm working on right now at the time, they're putting together either a booklet or a series of articles to where you'll be able to sit down and, and read through it and go back and forth with your Bible and, and try to analyze it. Maybe I'll put together another chart that somebody later on can tear apart uh, to try to help people to understand the, the way these things fall out. I feel much better, frankly, about all this than I did a few weeks ago. And the reason I do is because I've finally come to realize that, that you have to be careful not to lock yourself in to a certain way of looking at prophecy, because if you do, you can get blindsided. Things can begin to take place and you don't really understand them or know what they mean or what the consequences of them could be as we approach the very time of the end. 